Over 2,000 years ago, in spring and autumn period China, before China was united, the city-state of Song was facing imminent destruction. The state of Chu to the south, the colossal superpower of the time, was preparing an invasion to take the capital of Song. Not only that Chu had the size and numerical advantage, it had developed a secret weapon, one that will allow their soldiers to easily overcome Song's defensive walls, the Cloud Ladder. But the fate of Song is not yet sealed. In fact, it is currently being decided a few hundred miles away at the capital of Chu over a war game. Playing for Chu is the brilliant military engineer Gong Su Ban, a man who will one day be known as the patron god of engineers. And playing for the Song side is an unassuming old man in dirty and ragged clothing who looked like some random carpenter you can find anywhere off the street. Uh, can he really save the state of Song? <laughs> oh, come on, you know how this kind of story goes. The mysterious old man always saves the day. It's a given. But who in the world is he? During the spring and autumn and warring states era, China had a free marketplace of ideas. Philosophers and thinkers competed against each other to get their ideas heard, and they were called the Hundred Schools of Thought. Then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Oh no, wrong script. I mean, everything changed when Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China, united the land and burned the books of all other schools of thoughts besides legalism. Only the text of a few schools of thought survived, and among them was the book on Mohism, named after Mozi, the founder of the philosophy. In one episode of Mozi's life, he visited the state of Chu on behalf of the state of Song. He is there to convince them that the invasion will inevitably fail because him and his followers will defend the tiny state to the death. And to prove it to the king of Chu, he challenged the smartest man in the court, the military engineer Kong Su Ban, to a war game simulation, pitting their siege engines and strategies against each other. So this is not just some ancient Chinese Warhammer 40k. What is at stake here is more than the egos of two engineering nerds. If Mozi were to fail here, then it will reveal the flaws of his plan and proves that Song can be taken. The fate of thousands of Song citizens lies upon his hand, so he must win this game. Meanwhile, Gong Su Ban knew that he wasn't going to lose. Again, for the ninth time in a row! The Mohists were a group of pacifists that preaches the idea of universal love, which is antithetical to the Confucian belief that the family needs to be prioritized before care is extended outwards. The Mohists thought that if you love everyone equally, family, friends, or strangers, then the world would be a much better place. So they hate wars, especially invasions. But instead of running away at the first sight of an invading army, they would come to the aid of the defender. To the king's dismay, these bleeding heart fools are not idiots. They had some of the most brilliant mathematicians and siege engineers in their rank. Not a surprise, since Mozi himself was rumored to be a carpenter, a mere commoner. But their siege weaponry and counter-siege tactics is nothing to be scoffed at. Siege crossbows, traction trebuchets, and anti-sapping poison gas, these are just some of their arsenals. And for that time period, those are state-of-the-art weaponry. The outcome of the game was unsurprising. With Gong Su Ban's last war machine lay crushed on the mock battlefield, Mozi had proven that he can repel all their attacks. He won the game. But it is not over yet. He could read Gong Su Ban's expression from across the table. His rival hasn't conceded defeat. Gong Su Ban is an exceedingly clever man who is adept at thinking out of the box. Just because he lost a simulated war fair and square, it doesn't mean that he would lose a real war, where fighting dirty is an option. Yet, he is an honorable man. So he said, I know how I can beat you, but I will not say it. 
Mo Zi replied, And I know how you think you can beat me, but I will not say it either. <laughs> hey, hey, why, why are you all laughing? What is it that you can't say? Can somebody explain to me what's happening? My king, the solution my friend Gong Su Pan here is thinking of is easy to guess. He thinks that if he murders me here, then Song will be left defenseless. But it won't. My disciple and 300 followers are already waiting for the Chu army on the city walls of Song. Killing me here won't help you achieve your goals. The Mohists were also great debaters because they studied logic. Before the game had even started, Mozi had already pointed out the fact that Chu is way more prosperous than the tiny state of Song. In addition, there is still plenty more land their citizens can develop before they need to expand. Even if they somehow win, they have little to nothing to gain from this invasion. Perhaps the king doesn't care for the lives of his soldiers, but he would certainly value his reputation. The shame of being defeated by such a small state is hardly worth the risk. Fine, I won't attack Song then. And Mo Zi was set free. To the rulers of expansionist states, the Mohists are nothing but nuisance. After defending one state from an attack, they will move to the other state to defend it from a retaliatory attack. They have no loyalty to anything than their stupid ideal of righteousness and ten core doctrines. So that's why Mohism had difficulty finding state sponsors. Later, returning from Chu, when Mo Zi was traveling through Song, he was caught in a rain. When he tried to find shelter under a gate, the gatekeeper who didn't recognize him drove him away. So he had to spend the night in the rain. So he said, doing God's work won't bring recognition, like working for others to see. This story comes from the main Mohis text, and it contains a very important Mohist message. You shouldn't expect rewards for doing the right things. Sometimes you might even be punished for it. Unlike the Taoists, the Mohists believe in a personal god. Their version of heaven, the generic Chinese term for gods, is a benevolent one. It desires righteousness and loves the common people in almost a Judeo-Christian way. But the biggest difference here is that there is no promise of paradise or everlasting life for being righteous. So they basically have to be righteous just for the sake of it and they want people to know what they are signing up for. You know, a lot of us like superheroes, because when they help us, we don't have to give anything back, as they quietly disappear into the shadows. Some people even want to become superheroes themselves, because it is cool. But let me ask you this, would you risk and sacrifice yourself to help others, knowing that you would probably be vilified for it? So that's why Mohism wasn't a very attractive ideology, even for the common folks. After the mass book burning by Qin Shi Huang in the Qin Dynasty and the state-sponsored promotion of Confucianism, its rival ideology in Han Dynasty, the Mohist had practically disappeared. Anyway, just so you know, we've got a playlist on other philosophies from ancient China. Check it out if you want to watch more. We release at least one video a week. So if you don't want to miss out on our weekly videos, then you should subscribe. And if you'd like to help us create more contents on the history of Asia and other parts of the world, then you can do so by liking, commenting, and sharing our videos because it boosts the YouTube algorithm. Until next time, stay cool, my bros.